Any questions, feel free to chime in at any time. Uh, I know that these guys at the back don't like it, but I like it, and I'm more important than them right now. Hopefully, at least for the next three minutes, and then stop, li stop liking me, and they'll cut me off. <laughs> but that's the way it is. Uh, this presentation is called NS Client++ What's New? And the reason for that is I submitted my proposal about a year ago, and I have no clue what to talk about. The presentation should have been called Monitoring Simplified. Because that's really what I've been trying to sell here. Hopefully, I'll succeed, but we'll have to see about that. Uh, it will also be a bit different than the presentation I normally do, because it's trying to be less PowerPoint and more, I don't know, slides, I guess. Um, the reason is I read this book about how to make awesome presentations. I'm not telling you this will be awesome, because I sort of ditched half their advice and half the things they said I shouldn't do, I'll do anyway, because I like it. Um, but I'm doing things a bit different. And the first example of this is that they said to involve the audience, and that's you guys. So the first question is, of course, how many people use NS Client++ in? Right. Next question is, of course, how many people like NS Client++? Right, at least a few of you. And the final question is, how many people think NS Client++ is simple to use? Yeah, that's that's what I was aiming for. Hopefully, we will change that, but we'll see. There are some people who say it's not simple to use. But first, since I'm here, I need to talk about myself. And uh, my name is Michael Medin. And the most important thing about me to know is that the clicker is not working, as always. Let's see if this one works better. It's a bit of a task. This one is Bluetooth. Bluetooth is better. Awesome. Uh, I'm Dev. Everyone likes Slack. But I don't use these products really for living. It's just a hobby. And the reason I'm here is because I've worked in ops a long time ago and uh, sort of been doing this as a side gig ever since. But what I do is I work with Oracle Fusion Middleware building SOA solutions. So if you ever need to integrate your monitoring with your, you know, whatever other systems you have, call me. I'm your guy. If you need monitoring advice, call someone else. But we're here to talk about NS Client++. So that's what we're going to do. And the first thing you need to understand is that NS Client++ is an agent. And by agent, we mean a program you need to deploy somewhere. It's also been around for quite some time. Unfortunately, I don't have a date for when I started this, but it was sometime in 2003. So it could have been that I should have had a big cake with 10 candles on it by now, but no date, no cake. It's also a Windows agent. At least most people think that. It was that up until version 040. Nowadays, it's actually a Linux and window, Windows agent. So it runs just as well on Linux as it does on Windows. So it's platform independent. Unfortunately, there are no packages for it on Linux, but we'll get into that a bit later. It's also modular by design, and this is something I like and something I will never change, even though people <laughs> think it's kind of cumbersome to specify what you want to load, which modules, and that kind of thing. I think that's actually an important feature. It's also open source and not open core, which is kind of a popular concept. This means that regardless of how much money you pay me, you will not get a better version. But feel free to try. I'm always open for more money. It's also highly extensible in the spirit of Nagios, meaning that if it doesn't do what you want it to, you can always make it do it with scripts or add-ons or something like that. 041 has been around for a year. I was hoping to release 043 sometime this month. Oh, sorry, 042 sometime this month. Mm, we'll see. I'm still hoping, but uh, I've hoped a lot of things in my life, so we'll see. Uh, 043 will also be out fairly soon. It's like, what, half a year away, but it will not be that far off. And the reason behind this is that the versioning is sort of that 043 will be 042 with less bugs. So there will not be that many new features in it, but more things that were missing or bug fixes and that kind of thing. Um, this is important to understand. 041 is stable. If you're using 037, please leave. If you're using 027, please go home. Uh, old versions, I don't really support them, and they don't work. Quite frankly, there's a lot of bugs in a lot of stuff with old. So please use 041 or do something else. Oh, it's also one-man band, and this is something I've been trying to change for years and years and years, but no, it doesn't work. It has to be that people don't like me. 
but this means that I'm the guy singing whilst you know playing the harmonica guitar and driving the rocket propelled car and the reason I sort of bring this up is because it means that there is no company there's no commercial version there is no paid time to work in NS++ and this of course has some implications and the biggest thing is that I want you to please not be angry with me because very often people come to the forums and they ask something and I promise them you know like you know, I'll do this tomorrow and I'll just completely forget about it and it never happens. And the reason is not that I hate you. The reason is that sometimes there are other things that are, well, not more important perhaps, but has a higher priority or I'll, they'll be scream and become grumpy. You people don't do that, so might want to try that. But we do have sponsoring, we do have donations, and I will actually be doing some sort of support thing in the coming months. And the main reason for the support thing is actually not to make a commercial venture of this. It is more to sort of understand what is actually important. Because right now there are people coming to the forum asking questions and I sort of spend an equal amount of time upon something that someone might think is cool as I do an, a core critical feature which someone actually needs. And if you have a support system then people can sort of escalate the important stuff and say yeah, this is actually something we need whereas all the fluffy cool stuff I implement are something that might not be that important. So if you're interested, uh, please contact me because I don't know anything about business, so the whole how to do support is, is completely beyond me. But I do try, I do try, and I'm a quick learner. Also, as I said, sponsoring, a big thank you to my sponsors, OP5. They're sort of here today, I guess, in the spirit of uh, Andreas Ericsson. And transitive technology, some, someone has to explain that. I think they sort of resell OP5, which is kind of weird because that's a package version of Nagios, but something along those lines. Worth Phoenix and at one step two, of course, sell their own version, which has sort of packeted applications around it and a lot of cool stuff. So please check them out if you need commercial things around Nagios. But what's new is the title for the presentation. So I guess I'll have to do that or you'll all feel cheated, right? And we'll start with 041, which is not very new at all, but I wasn't here last year, so I'll have to sort of allow you to catch up. And the uh, biggest change, or one of the biggest change, is that sockets now are a lot better. They support IPv6, they support SSL, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and this meant that for the first time in my life, I could actually say that it is secure, because you can do certificate-based authentication, which means that you might actually dare to put this on the internet if you wanted to. And then, you know, a couple of months ago, I guess by now, then this guy comes along. And all of a sudden, SSL is no longer secure, right? Because NSA have backdoors in it. So now I'm back on square one. But I guess that's what you have to live with. Um, this, of course, means that the standard protocols, which are NRP, NSA, and Check NT, have been modernized. And the biggest issue there is, uh, for instance, timeouts now work, which a lot of people think it's a bit of a bother because they don't really understand the concept of timeouts. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly tell anyone there who's thinking about timeouts, if you put 30 seconds over here as a timeout, and then you sort of call service over here and you run some stuff over here and set 30 second timeout over here, it will not work because when this guy times out, this guy timed out slightly before it because it started its timeout about one, two seconds earlier. So if you want to set timeouts, please set this one bigger and this one smaller or it won't work. Uh, I think I've responded to that in like 10 times the last few weeks, so um, I felt I had to get it out. We also added, or we, I also added a whole bunch of new protocols, uh, some of them more useful than others, but I thought it was a cool thing to do, so I did it. And this is something I actually think is cool. It's called real-time checks. It's just a fancy word I made up, but we'll get into that a bit more later. But in 041, we have it for event logs and log files, and in 042, we'll get it or a whole lot more stuff. Uh, I don't really know about this one, to be honest. Uh, I sort of s stole that from a slide last year, and it's not really a simplified command line syntax, but it is a coherent command line syntax, which it wasn't before. So it's been changed anyway. Um, this is also, could or could also be something that you should actually think about, because 041 was released a year ago, but that was not the end, because there's been multiple new revisions released since then, which has bug fixes and you know s small new features and that kind of thing. So uh, please check back periodically because something happens in between the, the sort of like major version releases. Um, and now we'll get to 042, which is why I'm here. This is the interesting part, I guess. 
Um, modern Windows support. It's been kind of weird because I have a Windows agent that doesn't really monitor the new stuff which Win Microsoft has been doing with Windows for the last five, six years. So for instance, uh, in Windows 2008, the, uh, event log API, er, the event log API changed. And in some other version, the uh, check task schedule in APIs changed as well. So a lot of these new APIs has not been supported with NS++, which is a bit weird. All that is hopefully fixed, at least all the ones I know about are now supported. So this means that with 042 and going forward, you will be able to check all the event logs, not just certain which are using the old APIs, as well as to schedule tasks and that kind of stuff. But it also means that we will have a lot more new things we can do to check, because the, for instance, check process can do a lot more stuff than it could before. Uh, and same thing with check memory and all of those checks. So you have a lot more flexibility with what you can do. Uh, all the checks which existed before were sort of inherited from the way they looked, you know, 10 years ago when I started this project. Now they have all been rewritten. And now this clicker is not working. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry, it was working, it was just slow. Uh, Real-time monitoring is something I'll talk about later on. And that's also been one of the goals to have that pretty much across the block. And as I said, we'll get into it later, so I won't really mention it here. This is the big one, though, simplified monitoring. Um, one of the problems when you have been working on a project for like 10 years is that what seemed like a good idea at the time has you know, been added on and added on and added on. And when you have 10, 15 checks all going in different directions, you end up with a big mess. Um, the way I sort of approached this was you know, get rid of the old and do something new. So henceforth, there will be a new way to handle command line arguments and that kind of stuff. Don't be too upset, though, because there will be a way for the NS client to convert the old checks into the new checks. Because in many places, it's just sort of a syntactical thing and not a really a structural thing. So the old checks will, in most cases, work the same, even with a newer version. It depends a bit on some weird edge cases it's not covered. But for most people, it will just continue to work. But as always, if you want to use the new features, you need to move with the new checks. Um, Linux checks was another big goal. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later. But I find it kind of strange that you have to do check CPU in one way on Windows and another way on Linux. And I thought it would be kind of neat to have it work the same across the board. Um, of course, Linux is not the primary platform for me. So, uh, and since I'm just the one guy, I have limited time. Uh, but I would really like more people to get involved with help developing the Linux version of the checks and that kind of stuff. But initially, the idea is to support memory, CPU, and process, and the kind of core checks you have on Windows. So they will be working the same way on Linux as well. So hopefully, it will soon become platform independent. Right now, you can run NS Client++ on Linux, and you can run, for instance, external scripts, and you can run you know, a whole bunch of stuff, but not the core system checks. So in a way, it, it already is probably more advanced than the regular NRP server or client you have, but it's not quite as good as it is on the Windows side. But that will change with 0.4.2. Um, 042 is available and has been out for quite some time. Not released, I would like to add. And this is sort of the status of things. Modern Windows support is all done, which means that if you want to do some checks on you know, newer event logs or something like that, you can do all that. Also, the whole simplified thing is also there, and the extended check processes and you know, check services and all of that kind of stuff. It's already all there. Uh, Real-time monitoring and NSCP protocol and check XXX client. Uh, don't get confused. It's just a way to say NRPE or NSCA or you know whatever word you want to put there. Uh, not that some might have thought. Are sort of started but not finished. And the only thing that's read here is Linux checks because I haven't got around to that yet. So though they may not make it into 042. We'll see. It depends on how much time I have. But I hope, as always. But a couple of examples, and this is just a handful of things that are new in 042. For instance, there is now a check OS version, which can give you back uh, the operating system version, obviously, but also the revision, service pack, and that kind of stuff. Check process has been extended immensely. Now it works pretty much like task manager. If you want to check if a process is using a certain amount of memory, you can do that. You can check how long it's been running, and you know how much CPU it's using, and all those kind of stuff. So essentially, just like task manager, except you can check all of those things. So that's pretty cool, I think. 
page file is a new check for checking the actual page file size and utilization, that kind of stuff. And this, hopefully I would have expected people to sort of stand up and applaud at this. PDH has been totally ripped out. You can still use counters if you want to, but all of the core system checks is no longer using PDH. For those of you who don't know what PDH is, it's the performance counter thing which Microsoft added. And it's probably the worst thing they've ever done. I really hate it. Because first of all, they're localized, which means that whenever you go outside of the USA, they don't work because all the counters are called, you know, like memory or, sorry, minus commit get all nothing, and no one understands that, right? And it's even worse when you get to, for instance, Poland, because they're not even using the same letters I'm using. There's like, what is this? I can't even <laughs> type it. Uh, and and then, then it's very buggy because, uh, for instance, if you're using HP performance counters, they tend to leak memory in my program. I don't really know why they even allow that. Uh, and a lot of them just ends up saying, no, don't work, you know, counter, denominator, something, error. And it's hundreds of these. And I spend a lot of time just trying to get rid of it. But now it's all gone. So check CPU will always work henceforth, hopefully. Check service, uh, this is probably one of the most requested features because of the delayed start thing. Uh, for me, it's not really a big issue, but it's there, so you can now check services without having to worry about delayed start. And there will be an NRPE client, meaning you can do check NRPE from NS client instead of having to, what you do now, you have to start the entire NS client server, and then you can run the check inside of the server. But there will be a dedicated, tiny, low memory command which you can run instead. Uh, and the main thing here is to make it easier to get it up and running on Linux. So you can do your security stuff and that kind of thing, which regular NRP does not support. And with that, we're going to move on to filters. And filters is really the core behind simplified monitoring. So uh, I'm going to try to explain something that hopefully most of you will already understand. But uh, bear with me if you have been working with a database ever in your life. This is an event log, for instance. And we have, uh, obviously, level over here. We have source, source being the application generating the messages, and level being the type of message it is. So if we want to filter on level equals error, for instance, what we do is we say filter level equals error, which is sort of what I said. Uh, and that's really the idea here is that if you read this, you should understand it. And if you want to change this, it will probably not be too difficult to do that. Or if you instead want to get the source equals app1, uh, well, we write filter source equals app1, works the same. So there are no magic, weird, long keywords with pluses or minuses or anything like that, which we had before. This has been around in event logs for a couple of versions, and now it's being brought across the board. So we're going to use this example, and we're going to start off with source equals app1, and I will sort of try to explain why this is necessary. because. It's kind of easy to make options for doing a specific task. But some people always come along and they say, yeah, but I want app one or app three. And then it's kind of difficult to do that with options because there is no way to say that this option and this option in which order they should go or how they should be connected to each other. Uh, and then you know, someone says, yeah, but I want all the errors as well. And then you can just keep stacking these on and on and on as long as you want. And you can probably do this with options, but then you come to something like this and say, yeah, but Excel is just rubbish. We don't want those messages. And then it's kind of difficult to get this. So with these new filters, which is, by the way, based on, of course, SQLs and where classes, you can just set a parenthesis around this first half and not source equals Excel. So if we try to read this, it will be fairly easy to understand what it is actually doing and what you're actually trying to get from this filter. So yeah, they're slow sometimes. And moving on, uh, this is sort of the end result, right? So now we don't get the Excel anymore because they're excluded. And if we want to simplify this a bit, we can set source in app one, app three, instead of doing the whole or, 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 or thing. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this actually works. A guy came to me and said, well, apart from a few bugs, came to me and said that it doesn't work. And I asked him what his filters were, and he gave me this. And I think this is a good example of the fact that it does actually work. And no one in their you know, right mind would write this. <laughs> but, but he obviously needed to. 
and it, it apart from, from there were a couple of bugs making it not work, it does actually work. And I think this sort of proves that this is powerful enough to be able to do pretty much anything. So I think it is something that can actually work and can actually solve a lot of the problems you have when you want to do something that is slightly more advanced and say, I want to filter on this string. Uh, so what can you do? Well, you have a couple of standard operators, as they're called in the programming world. Essentially, they are like equal signs and greater than and less than and that kind of thing. We also saw that we had in if you want to check if a value exists in a list or not in if you want to do the opposite, right? Uh, this is mainly for the paranoid people who don't want to send greater than signs through NRPE. So then you can do it with equals instead of typing the actual equal sign over here. Uh, they have the exact same effect. If we look at strings, well, you can do pretty much the same thing, though the whole greater than for strings is completely beyond me. It doesn't really make sense, I think. But you also have things like uh, like, yeah, and regular expression matching and that kind of thing. So I think it is powerful enough to be able to do pretty much what anyone wants. Um, but that's what I think. Also, since this was working out so great, being simple and all, I needed to complicate it a bit, right? So what we have is not just one of these. We have several of these. The first one, filter, sort of defines what we are interested in. Uh, if you have, for instance, a CPU check, you have 14 cores in the machine. Are you interested in the load on every single core or just the total? Or if you're looking at an event log, do you just want to have the errors? Or do you want to look at every single message in the event log file? That's what filter is for. Define what you're interested in. Then we have two other ones. The first one is warning, and the other one is critical. They work the same, they look the same, but the difference is that instead of saying what I'm interested in, they tell Nagios what happened to the machine. So they will generate an alert, or well, a warning or a critical alert in Nagios. Uh, and then this little weird guy, which uh, sort of negates the previous ones. Uh, don't ask me, I just thought it was a cool thing at the time. Probably something how to eat up later on. But uh, you can sort of go back if you said it's a warning, then you can say, no, I changed my mind. It's OK. Um, right, this is weird. This is like the same slide all over again. Oh, oh well. Apparently, this is the same slide all over again. Uh, this should probably be the display slide, actually. Um, ah, no, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm completely confused. This is explaining the warning. Uh, so we have filters, source equals app one, right? And we say, if it is level warning, then it's a warning. This means that these both two lines will be reported back in the text string to Nagios if you wanted to, but only when we have this guy will there be an actual warning generated. The other one will be in OK status. But you can still get the data from that line, and you can still get the information, because you're interested in the line doesn't mean that it's a warning or a critical state. Right, yeah, fancy arrow animation. Actually, now we come to the display slide, so now I'm no longer confused. Right, custom strings, because uh, a lot of people want to display a lot of different things. And I always thought that, nah, what you want to get is what you want to display. But other people have other ideas. So I sat down and figured out, how do I solve this? And well, the idea is that now we can provide the strings, or the, the template for the strings. And then you can put in substitutions, which are the dollar brace keyword end brace things which a lot of programming language are using. Uh, and this way, you can sort of shape your own strings and get them to do whatever you want. Now, this has to be a bit more complicated. Otherwise, it would be easy. So there's, of course, two of them, one for the top-level message and one for the detail-level message. And hopefully, everyone already understood this, right? Not so, OK. Let me try to explain it. Detail-level syntax says we want to see the source from the individual rows in the event log, right? Top level syntax says we want to see the list of their data and whatever you know, message we feel we want to put in. So if we put these together, what we would get would be just one hello, but a whole bunch of s, 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 s for each individual record which matched the filter. So it's not that complicated, but uh, I guess I've said that before, and no one has ever believed me. But we'll see. Um, a couple of examples check page file, for instance. In this case, I just want to get the total page file size. I'm not interested in the C drive or the D drive. I just want the total. Therefore, it says, OK, give me the total. Scrap everything else. Check uptime. Well, we can set warning, minus two days, uptime, or say critical, minus one day, if uh, whatever we want to have our thresholds on. Or 
check process down here. We're using the detailed syntax to say we, we want to warn if working set is about 70 megabytes, but we also want to see the handle count and the user time. So we can get back a lot more information than the things we're actually checking. If we want to do, you know, matrix or, you know, see things or whatever to correlate why something is wrong. So simple, and maybe this is what everyone is thinking. I don't know. It is what I was thinking. Because it means you all of a sudden have to type all these long filter strings, right? And all these long syntax strings and all these long detailed syntax strings and all that kind of thing. And what I sort of came up with as a solution to this problem was sensible defaults. And the idea here is that if you run check CPU, it should just work. No options, no filters, nothing. Check CPU will take your total CPU matrix and, you know, if it's about 80 or 90% or something like that, and give you a warning in the critical state. And that is probably what most people want. If you want to change something, well, then you can go in and do that. But out of the box, all the commands without options will do what is the sensible thing to do and what is most people will do out there. And if you look at most people out there, they tend to use check NT because it is simple and you don't have to write a lot of options and that kind of thing. And this is sort of a way to try to do the same thing. Check CPU just works. It shouldn't be more difficult than that. So let's see the time. We're not too bad, actually. Real-time monitoring is the next thing we're going to talk about. And this is something, as I said, I personally think is kind of cool. I don't know about you guys. And since I'm here speaking, I don't really need to know what you think. Uh, this is the way a lot of people do their checks. They have a Nagios server over here, runs a couple of checks to monitor the server over here. And this list tends to get longer and longer and longer and longer because you want to check more and more and more things. Uh, of course, this is not very good for Nagios because it has to do the forking and it has to do the you know, running things and they have to be transported around and you know, there's firewalls and network data and all that kind of stuff. And you have to do this every you know, five minutes or one minute or something. But most importantly, if there's an error, you will get that five minutes too late because it's already happened, everything you see. Then they have this passive monitoring thing, which I think is actually just a way to get around firewall issues. Because generally, you solve that by having the monitored server do a check every five minutes, and you submit back the results. It's still delayed. You can do this in real time. Uh, but generally it's delayed and you always, or always, but you generally also send the a K message back, right? Now what I sort of wanted to, or sorry, well, we end up with having the errors going the other way, right? But what I sort of thought was a neater idea was why not just send the errors back and nothing else? A bit like SNMP traps, right? Oh, you can always have an, yeah, it's fine, trust me, if you want. And if you don't believe your solutions actually work. But there's no point in, you know, sending back, yeah, there were no errors in the event load file, I just checked because hopefully it will work, right? Uh, so that's sort of the idea with real-time monitoring, that you send the problems and not the OK messages and the everything else messages, right? And this is the way this works. Now we're, first of all, on Linux, and you can do this with 041 and have been able to do it for a year. We have something called check log file, which checks text files for errors using the filter syntax I just explained to you. So that's all been out there for quite some time. And what we do is we tell the Linux kernel that, hey, whenever this file changes, tell us. This means that, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. There is no CPU overhead or extremely little CPU overhead. You don't have to go out and pull the file. You don't have to do any checking. You're just telling the kernel, send me an event whenever the file changes, and I'll listen to that. And then you go back to sleep. It also means that we have the whole powerful syntax things when the file changes, because we can go in and we can see whatever we want from the file. And we can do the whole SQL, like filtering on regular expression strings, whatever we want. And then we can send it off to NSA, and we get the error almost instantly. There is, of course, a slight network lag, right? So it might take you a few milliseconds or something. But it is as close to real time as you're probably going to get. And if we're going to look at how we would actually go about doing this, well, this is the configuration for it. The first thing is we are modular, right? We need to load the modules we're interested in. What we need is check log file, NSCA, and simple file writer. We don't actually need the simple file writer. That's just doing it for fun. Or actually, I stole the slides from a demo I did before, and then I needed file writer because I didn't have NSCA server running. Uh, then we need to define the actual check 
And as you can see here, we have the warning and the critical syntax, which I just showed you. So if column one contains the string warning or column two contains the string critical, that would define the alert status we're going to send to Nagio. Uh, we, of course, need to tell it which file we're going to check and where we want to send it. In this case, we want to send it both to file and to NSCA. And finally, since we're using NSCA, we need to tell it the password and the encryption scheme and the IP address so we have somewhere to send it from. And that's it. Nothing else. So I think this is not too complicated, uh, and it's fairly straightforward. And more importantly, it's not a lot of configuration or, or a lot of things you need to set up. It's fairly straightforward. People, they prefer to use NRPE because currently NSCA and NRPE are sort of firewall issues more. So if you have a firewall restriction, well, you need to use one or the other. Well, we might not get the total benefit from this through NRPE, but what we can do is we can still lose the CPU overhead because we have the Linux kernel telling us something. We still have the powerful filtering and we can instead store the value inside a cache. And then when the check comes from Nagios, we can fetch it instantly, which means that the latency will become much less because we don't need to actually here go out and check the file because it's all stored in memory inside NS Client Plus Plus. So it just takes you fractions of a second to get it back. So it's still quite a lot of benefit from this. Uh, looking at the configuration, it's almost the same. We need to change a couple of modules because we need NRPE, obviously, and the caching thing going on there. We need to change the destination we want to send the messages to because now we want them in the cache instead of the NSCA. If we want, we could put you know, NSCA as well here if we want to send them at the same time or something like that. And of course, we need to allow NRPE to connect to our server because we're paranoid, right? So we need to tell it which IP address it has. And that's pretty much it. And then I always get this question, how about graphing? Because some people, they like pretty graphs, right? And I really have two things to say. The first thing is, well, you can always store it in the cache and fetch it from there, right? You won't get much in the way of benefit because you still have to pull the data. The only difference is you can probably pull it, you know, not quite as often. Or the other one is you can submit it passively. Uh, but, and this is really the big thing, but don't do this to Nagios. Send it to your graphing solution. You send it to Graphite or your data warehouse or something. There's no reason to flood Nagios with you know, 4,000 OK messages just because you want to draw a graph at the other end. And also, graphing is, tends to be not real-time intensive. So you can grab that data you know, once every week or once every day or something when you want to draw your graphs. Uh, so there's no reason to do checks every five minutes just because you want to get some data into a database behind Nagios. There are much better ways to transfer that data. Which brings us to Linux. As I said, it actually worked on Linux, and I demoed it on Linux actually last time I did this presentation. Uh, so it actually works on Linux. But how do you get it on Linux? That's the big question. Well, unfortunately, you cannot download it, and there are no packages. Um, instead, you have to build it, which means that you have to, you know, app get install some stuff, you know, to give git, git clone. And then you need to build it with CMake first. CMake is like configure for those who haven't used it and then run make. And it's a bit like you know, this car here. You know, my three-year-old can probably build it um, if given the right instructions. And if we want to compare this to, for instance, building it on Windows, where it's not something my three-year-old will be doing, something I will be doing because it's fun, right? Uh, because there you need to build hundreds of stuff and you know, compile it, and it'll be a tremendous amount of work. Uh, what I did for 041 was this little guy. What that will do is actually fetch all dependencies, download them for you, build them for you, and set up the configuration so it can just build everything. And this, at least for me, saves me a tremendous amount of time when I'm build, gonna build on, on my build machines because I don't have to manually compile and patch all these down. But it's still a lot more work to get it running on Linux, or Windows, sorry. Uh, one thing that is important to note, though, is that this actually works even if you're using Visual Studio Express. So even if you don't have a license for Visual Studio, you can download the free version and build NS Client++ if you're so inclined. There are some things that you will not get because, for instance, Check VMI is using uh, the ATL library, which is only available through the professional version of, of uh, Visual Studio. So you will not get that specific module. But most of the modules will build just fine. Uh, and of course, hopefully there is a bunch of Linux people out here. So feel free to help me out with packages spec files and that kind of stuff, and I will give you free beer. And the whole free thing, because there's a lot of discussion about the actual meaning of it, 
uh, I tend to go with your free to buy it yourself, which might not be your version of free. But it is a version of free, which is very cheap for me. So that's why I go with it. Right, agentless monitoring is something that a lot of people think is cool. I am not really convinced. Uh, the main reason why I don't like agentless monitoring is actually not people want to use NS Client Plus Plus. It's actually that it tends to limit you because once you start going agentlessly, you have just BMI. And then, oh, I need to run this script. And it's like, nah, I can't do that without having to change my monitoring strategy. So what I've tried to do is sort of, ah, can't I get something agentless into NS Client Plus Plus? And then you can just deploy one little guy and you can still have the same strategy. And that's sort of the idea. And first of all, that means that it will be native Windows. So you can actually do a lot more stuff than you can do through VMI. It's also secure because you don't need to put your administrator password on a lot of Linux boxes in text files and that kind of thing. Instead, you can use the Windows internal authentication mechanisms. So you don't need to have the password configured anywhere, right? It's also simpler because it just works. You can do check CPU, right? And it would just work. Um, it's also faster because you do a lot more overhead when you need to go and fetch all the data and then process it on your own side. Of course, lightweight is the same thing there. But more importantly, it is a work in progress. So uh, it is not really there yet. Some things work, something doesn't. The, uh, whoa, wrong transition, by the way, but we'll live with that. Oh, wait. Oh, well. Uh, for instance, you can do check service. You can do check this, check task, check VMI. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do. And generally, if you can do this, there is some sort of computer option you can put in there, which will be the IP address or host name of the remote computer. And most of these will work using Windows authentication mechanism, which means that you don't have to supply a username or password as long as the user configured for NS Client++ can run them. If you start going down this route, you probably want NS Client++ installed as a specific user and not as local system or something like that, because then you can do your privileges a lot better. And if we're looking further ahead in 043, something I want to do, but maybe haven't really gotten around to, but I think it's actually doable and feasible, is uh, something along the lines of PSXAC, where you can just shoot out the script and run that and have it fetch the data for you. Uh, this would mean that you would be able to actually do external scripts and that kind of things through agent plus monitoring, which would be really, really cool, because then you would no longer be limited. You would be able to do everything that way. But as I said, that's sort of coming. Um, and with that, we're sort of back to this slide. So we talked initially on monitoring simplified, right? And you probably remember this little guy here. So how many people think this would be simple? None. Awesome. <laughs> ah, well, you can't get everything, I guess. Uh, if you have a better suggestion of what's simple, feel free to bump into me later on. Anyway, with that, I'm going to leave it for uh, any questions. And I'll say a big thank you. And, and while they walk around with a microphone, I'm sort of going to take a picture. Any questions? Everybody smile for Facebook. Yeah. Is the, uh, do you have the source available? Besides Git, just like a tarball or something? It's on GitHub. That's better. <laughs> you get the history as well. No, no, you can't download the source. It's tarball. OK. I saw it look like on the website, looked like only the, the older stuff was. So Yeah, the only thing you can download is Windows binaries. Everything else is on GitHub. OK. Um, I have a question regarding the Perfmon counters. Yes. Uh, so we have quite a few in-house built applications that are lovely enough that every time they get the service gets restarted, we have to rebuild the counters. Um, is in this uh, in this newer version? Is that uh, obviously the deficiency is on our side? But <laughs> is that something that uh, could is, is accommodated better or? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, it was accommodated very good in the old version. There, there is an option called the reload, which you can put on the check uh, counter command, and it will reload. So you can already okay. do that. 
Uh, there is also a way for some people who are doing weird performance counters, then you can actually fork, or fork, you can actually run AnyScline++ from command line to do the counters, and then it will be a complete new process, so then it's not a problem. But usually the reload option works fine. Okay, great, thanks. More questions? Otherwise they'll not invite me back because we're under time. We need to fill up the slots. Seriously. Any other questions? Nothing. Oh. Yeah, oh, oh, one guy in the back. We got one Thank in the back. You. I'll, I'll you know what's going to happen? You're going to leave tonight. and you'll be like, man, I wish I would ask that question. No, it's totally selfish. I'm kidding. Yeah, no, I'm not hearing anything. So. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what that's all about. That's horrible. Yeah. So, so the question was the microphone is bad? Yes, it <laughs> is. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, have you done anything in the um, newest builds to uh, enhance how it works with old ass versions of Windows? Because I have some of those, and they consistently have like semaphore timeouts or just check out, and we have to like reboot the whole box to get NS client to start. The, the question, just to repeat it, I think is: Is there anything in the new version to make it work better on older versions of Windows? Okay. And the question is: Yes, it doesn't work at all. So no. Uh, now I can actually mention that because what I've done is I've gone to a newer version of Visual Studio which can for some bizarre reason not compile to anything else than XP. And I think doing to push people to upgrade actually. Uh, I will investigate if there are people who has older versions because there is nothing in the code which prevents me from going back to the old compiler and doing a specific build for them. Uh, so if you have this kind of, or you have an older environment and still want to move on, please let me know because then I'll try to figure something out. We, we have quite a few, uh, I, I'm ashamed to admit, Windows 2000 servers that are apparently still important and uh, NS client runs fine for like, you know, an hour and then just checks out. Yeah, I, I've heard, there, and, and if you have this issue, please get in touch with me because as I said, I've heard some people tell me about it that it kind of dies on older versions. And I've sort of locked it down to something in the boost library, I think, because they have some sort of counter which is not really working OK. But there is supposedly be to be some sort of patch somewhere on the Microsoft side, I think, for it. But please get in touch with me, preferably through email. Is the email address here? Oh, yeah, it's op yeah, over there at the top left. Uh, and, and we can look at it. Because as I said, I've just had the people on the forum, and they generally tend to come back for six months later. And that's not really much of a dialogue. That's more like a monologue. Uh, please feel free to check out the site as well. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that there is something which I probably should have put here thinking about it. Uh, if you sort of write docs.nsclient.org, you will get to the new documentation site, which is the documentation for 042. Uh, what I've done for 042 is that I have moved the documentation from the wiki into the source code. So whenever I add an option, I'm sort of forced to write a description for it, and the documentation gets generated whenever I build. So the idea is that the documentation henceforth will be awesome. Yeah, the idea is the keyword here. But that's still a work in progress. But the documentation for the 042 version is all there. Um, you said that uh, you no longer send the OKs. You're only sending the errors and the criticals. How do you end up clean, uh, clearing up the alerts? So within Nodjo, is everything well, 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 still f First of all, first of all, uh, I'm not, there's no change. There's an option you can use. So real-time monitoring is not the way it works. It's something you can do if you want to. Uh, and all of these real-time monitoring things, you can say, well, if nothing has happened in this interval, send an OK anyway. So by default, I think every five minutes, it will spam your Nagio server saying, yeah, I'm still fine. I'm still fine. I love up-to-date documentation. What was the URL again? docs.nsclient.org. Thank yeah. you. If you're interested idea. in the newer version, uh, there are some uh, blog posts on the, on the blog tab on the, on the site as well where I sort of describe stuff and how it works and that kind of thing. Does it cover the filter syntax and stuff? Yes. Like uh, yeah, the blogs does sort of. Uh, the filter syntax, that's pretty straightforward. That I covered here. But the keywords you can put in there, they're all in the documentation. As, uh, for, each, for each filter, there will be a list of all these keywords exist and what they do. So for instance, if you look, check up, or you look, out, you look up check process, it will tell you that you, know, you have these options for you know, handles and you know, memory and that kind of stuff. So that's all in the documentation. 
The only thing that's missing from the documentation right now is examples, because I need to move them manually from the old site to the new one. And I'm going to do that once I get the 042 out. Super good. I also love samples. Yeah, they, they tell me that samples are good. Any more questions? Are you guys sure? Give you a couple seconds, think about it. Yes, no? All right, how about a nice big round of applause one more time for Michael Metton. Thank you.